Hello, this is Bikam Baskert, Professor of Medicine from Baylor College of Medicine. It's my pleasure to present on the topic of heart failure guidelines. These are my disclosures. In the 2022 ACCHA HFSA guidelines, we have classified ejection fraction as heart failure with reduced EF, mildly reduced EF, preserved EF, as well as improved EF. And we have specific recommendations for each of these ejection fraction classifications. Please do keep in mind in the new guidelines, we also have specific criteria for diagnosis and specifically elevated filling pressures, either detected by hemodynamic characterization or non-invasive imaging, or elevated natriotipeptide levels are required for the diagnosis of mildly reduced as well as preserved EF. This is very much harmonized with the universal definition of heart failure, which specified heart failure as a clinical syndrome with current or prior symptoms and or signs caused by structural, structural or functional cardiac abnormality corroborated by either elevated natriotic peptide levels or objective evidence of cardiogenic pulmonary or systemic congestion by diagnostic modalities such as imaging or by hemodynamic measurements. If we examine the current evidence and recommendations for treatment of heart failure with reduced EF, we can recognize that the quadruple therapy now is the foundational first step for treatment of patients with heart failure with reduced EF. In the guidelines, we recommend initiation of beta blockers, mineral cortical receptor antagonists, sodium glucose cotransporter 2 inhibitors, and RAS inhibition either with ARNI in NYHA class 2 to 3 or ACE inhibitors or ARBs in NYHA class 2 to 4 heart failure patients as step one. This is critical because these new therapies, specifically ARNI and HGLT2 inhibitors, have been shown to result in significant improvement in cardiovascular death and heart failure hospitalization as early as within the first 30 days of initiation. And in addition to their cardiovascular beneficial effects, they also result in significant improvement in renal outcome. Specifically, SGLT2 inhibitors and ARNI result in slowing of the decline of EGFR. They also result in significant improvement in quality of life and have a very good safety profile against comparator. ARNI, when compared against ACE inhibitors or ARBs, result in lesser incidence of worsening renal function or hyperkalemia. SGLT2 inhibitors, when compared against placebo, do not result in any um, adverse events related to hypoglycemia, ketoacidosis, uh, hyper or hypokalemia, or worsening renal function. It's critical for us to recognize the importance of initiation of quadruple therapy. The reason is heart failure is as deadly as cancer is. For women, the outcomes are very comparable to ovarian cancer and in men to colorectal cancer. Thus, time is of, is of essence, and it's critical to initiate these therapies as early as possible to change the disease trajectory. And I make the analogy to induction therapy that we use as a concept in treatment of cancer. So initiation of quadruple therapy is very much similar to induction chemotherapy. Initiation of SGLT2 inhibitions, ARNI or ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, and MRA should be achieved as early as four to six weeks as soon as the patient is diagnosed with heart failure with reduced EF. These step one medications can be initiated simultaneously at low doses or 
can be sequentially uptitrated, not according to the historical sequence of how these trials were conducted, but according to patient-specific etiologies, characteristics, or comorbidities. And yes, there are many different permutations um, as to how these medications can be initiated. All four can be initiated at low doses in certain patients who can tolerate all four, or two medications can be initiated concomitantly and the other two can be subsequently added, or three could be initiated and another one could be added. As to which one to initiate first and add subsequently can depend on according to patient specifications. For example, in a patient with active ischemia or tachycardia, beta blockers may be initiated early. In a patient with significant congestion by ventricular failure, SGLT2 inhibitors can be initiated earlier. In a patient with NYHA class four heart failure, ACE inhibitors may be preferred over ARNI due to their efficacy and lack of benefits seen in NYHA class four patients with ARNI. In the guidelines, we have specified step two as uptitration of the quadruple therapy. All four classes of medications should be uptitrated to optimal doses. We do have evidence that optimal doses of ACE inhibitors and beta blockers result in better outcomes. We also have evidence of reverse remodeling with ARNI and SGLT2 inhibitors. And this is critical for us to consider before initiation of other additional therapies and consideration of device therapies. And also keep in mind, these new agents, uh, specifically ARNI and SGLT2 inhibitors, are associated with reduction in sudden cardiac death. Thus, it's critical more than ever for us to initiate and optimize the quadruple foundational therapies in heart failure. How to uptitrate can be individualized according to patient specifics, and as well as the models of care available at your healthcare institutions and networks. One can have um, individual face-to-face -face visits or can have hybrid models of care with telehealth and multidisciplinary care coordination. We do have evidence that initiation of GDMT prior to discharge is quite effective and can result in better optimization and continuation of therapies. We also have evidence of safety and efficacy from the strong HF trial that guideline-directed therapies can be optimized as early as within two weeks of discharge, resulting in significant outcome benefit, including all-cause mortality. So with these evidence, it's critical for us to recognize that heart failure hospitalizations provide us a unique opportunity to initiate and uptitrate GDMT. Keep in mind, new agents such as SGLT2 inhibitors and ARNI enable initiation of other GDMTs such as mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists because of their efficacy as well as safety profile, especially in regards to potassium levels. Heart failure care coordination, especially in a multidisciplinary manner and with incorporation of telemonitoring is quite effective and can be incorporated in uptitration of guideline-directed therapies. So in the new era, we can utilize new models of care, including telehealth visits um, embedded um, in other traditional outpatient clinic visits can help us optimize guideline-directed therapies optimally as early as within four to six weeks of diagnosis. Also keep in mind, we now have evidence from smart electronic health record alerts helping the clinicians uptitrate the GDMT in an effective manner. Prompt HF, one of these trials demonstrated that EHR alerts can alert the clinicians for the indications to start as well as uptitrated doses of GDMT. After initiation and uptitration of the quadruple foundational therapy, additional therapies need to be considered 
Hydralazine nitrates are indicated in African-American Black heart failure patients with reduced EF. And ICD and CRTD should be considered for patients with heart failure with reduced EF. The CRT recommendations have not changed in the last iteration of the guidelines. Left bundle branch block morphology with a QRS exceeding that of 150 milliseconds still carries a class 1 recommendation for patients with heart failure with reduced EF. And the other QRS with permutations do carry the, uh, recommendations in the ranges of class 2A to B recommendations. Additional therapies such as ivabradine, digoxin, verisiguat are included as additional therapies. So I consider initiation of quadruple therapy as induction therapy. And these add-on therapies, with, which optimizes management of heart failure with either additional oral therapies such as hydralazine nitrates or ivabradine digoxin or verisiguat, or device therapies such as ICD and CRTD as consolidation therapies. If we examine these add-on therapies, ivabradine has a class 2A recommendation for NYHA class 2 to 3 heart failure patients with reduced EF uh, with normal sinus rhythm with a heart rate exceeding that of 70 beats per minute despite an optimal dose of beta blockade. Verisiguat, digoxin, polyunsaturated fatty acids, and potassium binders in individuals who have hyperkalemia while being treated with RAS inhibition have class 2B recommendation as add-on therapies. Additionally, surgical revascularization can be considered for patients with reduced EF and ischemic cardiomyopathy. Transcatheter edge-to-edge -edge mitral valve repair is, has a class 2A recommendation in patients with reduced EF with severe functional mitral regurgitation with left ventricular and systolic di a diameter less than 70 and a PA systolic pressure of uh, less than 70 millimeter mercury, uh, very similar to co-opt co inclusion criteria. And the transcatheter mitral um, edge to edge repair uh, to be considered only after optimization of GDMT, which is a class one recommendation. Wireless monitoring of PA pressure by implanted hemodynamic monitoring has a class 2B recommendation, especially for patients with heart failure hospitalization or elevated natriuretic peptide levels. We also have specific recommendations for patients with mildly reduced EF, those patients with ejection fraction between 41 and 49% EF, or patients with heart failure with preserved EF. And we do have evidence from two large-scale trials. The first one is Emperor Preserve trial, which demonstrated significant reduction in cardiovascular death and heart failure hospitalization in patients with heart failure with ejection fraction exceeding that of 40%. The benefits were seen as early as 18 days after initiation of therapy. Subsequently, in the DELIVER HF trial, we also saw significant benefit, again, with a second SGLT2 inhibition in patients with NYHA class 2 to 3 heart failure with mildly reduced, preserved, as well as improved EF. And again, the benefits were seen as early as within the first three weeks after initiation of therapy. In the DELIVER trial, which is one of the largest studies with patients with um, EF exceeding that of 40%, uh, we were able to also see benefit according to EF classification, including those with mildly reduced EF, normal EF, and even supranormal EF, those individuals with EF greater than 60%, um, as well as those with recent hospitalization and those with improved ejection fraction. When we wrote the guidelines, there was only one trial, the Emperor Preserve trial with SGLT2 inhibition. Therefore, SGLT2 inhibition was given a higher than the other agents 
uh, level of uh, recommendation, but a class 2A recommendation at the time of the writing of the guidelines for patients with mildly reduced EF. And other um, agents such as ACE inhibitors, ARB, ARNI, MRA, and beta blockers have class 2B recommendations. Very similarly, because at the time of the guideline writing, we had only one trial that was published, SGLT2 inhibition has a class 2A recommendation, and ARNI, MRA, and ARB have class 2B recommendations. Keep in mind, guidelines traditionally would consider um, a um, recommendation as a class one recommendation if there are more than two large scale trials demonstrating significant improvement in um, hard endpoints. And uh, at the time of the writing of the guidelines, we had only evidence from one trial, but subsequent to the tri uh, subsequent to the publication of the guidelines, we now have two trials uh, demonstrating benefits with SGLT2 inhibition. Please do keep in mind that we do not have any evidence of benefit for the indication of heart failure with treatment with beta blockers in patients with preserved EF. Therefore, beta blockers are not included as a recommendation in patients with HEF-PEF. For patients with heart failure with improved EF, with the results of the TRED-HF trial, which demonstrated that withdrawal of treatment of um, heart failure with reduced EF after normalization of EF and resolution of symptoms results in um, redevelopment of symptoms and decline in EF in a significant proportion of patients, suggesting that improvement in function and resolution in symptoms may re represent remission in, in a significant proportion of our patients rather than full recovery or full reversibility. Therefore, in the guidelines, we have, uh, we have a class one recommendation uh, for patients with improved EF after treatment for GDMT to be continued to prevent real loss of heart failure and LV dysfunction, even in patients who may become asymptomatic. Clinical trajectories are also very important. In the guidelines, very similar to the universal definition of heart failure, we emphasize not to use stable heart failure as a terminology, but persistent heart failure with the recognition that stable heart failure terminology creates inertia and the false presumption that the patient may not require optimization. Even if the patient has stable NYHA class two heart failure, therapies should be optimized because outcomes are uh, quite um, sobering and are very similar to cancer in heart failure. And thus, even in a patient who may appear with stable symptoms, the GDMT should be optimized. We also recommend use of heart failure in remission for those patients who may have resolution of their symptoms and normalization of their LV function. For hospitalized heart failure patients, we do have recommendations for GDMT to be initiated and optimized. And for patients experiencing transient and mild decrease in renal function or a mild rise in creatinine, or those individuals with asymptomatic reduction of blood pressure during hospitalization, diuresis, or after initiation of GDMT, for the GDMT not to be withheld or discontinued. The terminology of acute kidney injury, which is commonly used for these transient rises in, uh, uh, in creatinine during hospitalization, should not be commonly used as a diagnosis. The rise that we see in creatinine after diuresis or after GDMT actually does not reflect acute kidney injury and is a misnomer and a misdiagnosis. And in these circumstances, GDMT should not be withheld. And this is a recommendation in the guideline. We also do recommend GDMT to be initiated during hospitalization after clinical stability is achieved. This is supported by a, a variety of studies as shown on this slide by the IMPULSE study um, with initiation of SGLT2 inhibitors um, during the hospitalization after the um, hemodynamic stability is achieved 
and the benefits were demonstrated regardless of EF. And we also have evidence from Solowitz trial, uh, which demonstrated that initiation of an SGLT2 as well as SGLT2, SGLT1 and 2 inhibitor resulted in significant improvement in cardiovascular death and heart failure event rates with initiation of um, this SGLT1-2 inhibitor prior to discharge. In advanced heart failure patients, very similar to prior guidelines, we do have the recommendations for mechanical circuitry support and cardiac transplantation. And of course, throughout the whole continuum of heart failure care, consideration of lifestyle modification and palliative care considerations. And finally, I'd like to also emphasize that it's critical for us to diagnose the earlier stages of heart failure and intervene to prevent heart failure. In the guidelines, similar to the universal definition of heart failure, we emphasize the diagnosis of pre-heart failure stage. The former terminology we used for this stage was stage B. I would like to alert you to the new diagnostic criteria for pre-heart failure. Pre-heart failure are patients without current or prior symptoms or signs of heart failure, but with evidence of either structural, functional, or biomarker abnormality defined by either elevated cardiac troponin in the setting of exposure to cardiotoxicity or elevated natrotopeptide levels. Do keep in mind those individuals with risk factors for heart failure such as diabetes, hypertension, coronary artery disease, are considered to be at risk for heart failure. That's stage A. Those individuals without current or prior symptoms or signs of heart failure, without structural, functional, or biomarker abnormality, but with these risk factors, would be considered to be at risk for heart failure. A very important study, STOP HF trial, demonstrated efficacy of natriuretic peptide-based screening of patients at risk for heart failure. So those individuals with diabetes, hypertension, CAD, if were to be if screened with natriuretic peptides, and if the natriuretic peptide levels were elevated and referred to a multidisciplinary care in the STOP-HF trial, this approach resulted in a significant reduction in future development of heart failure events or development of LV systolic or diastolic dysfunction. With these results in the guidelines, we have a class 2A recommendation as for patients at risk for developing heart failure, natriuretic peptide-based um, screening followed by team-based care, including a cardiovascular specialist, can be useful to prevent development of LV dysfunction or new onset of heart failure. And in addition to that recommendation, in the guidelines, we have specific recommendation across all stages of heart failure. And finally, we have specific recommendations for treatment of comorbidities in heart failure, including IV iron replacement therapy as a class 2A recommendation, uh, uh, specific recommendations for AFib management, including um, ablation for atrial fibrillation, especially when the symptoms of heart failure can be attributable to atrial fibrillation. And we do have a class one recommendation for SGLT2 inhibition for patients with diabetes and heart failure. So I consider initiation of quadruple foundational therapy as the induction therapy, the additional therapies um, as consolidation therapy, and treatment of comorbidities as the final step for optimization of therapies in treatment of heart failure. So in summary, in the 2022 heart failure guidelines, in patients with heart failure with reduced EF, quadruple therapy with ARNI or ACE inhibitors or ARBs, SGLT2 inhibition, beta blockers and MRA are recommended to reduce morbidity and cardiovascular mortality. In mildly reduced EF and preserved EF, SGLT2 inhibition has a higher level of recommendation than other agents. And in patients with improved EF, GDMT should be continued to prevent relapse of heart failure. And do be aware that there are specific diagnostic criteria for pre-heart failure, 
And we do have specific recommendation across the continuum of stages of heart failure. And please, please do not delay initiation and optimization of guideline-directed therapies in heart failure. Avoid use of terminology such as stable heart failure. And time is of essence because the outcomes in heart failure are as bad as in cancer is. And do keep in mind, there are no gender or sex differences in benefit from heart failure therapies. All heart failure therapies are indicated in women as they are in men. And there is definitely a significant importance in these guidelines, guideline-directed therapies to be optimized in women as well as in men. Thank you for your attention.